Welcome to the second tutorial for uh, EMVM 7124 International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management for Summer Semester 2019. So today is the 20th of January and what we're going to do is uh, I'm just going to recap um, very quickly the exam information. We spent time on that last week but if you've got any questions about it, worthwhile just recapping that briefly but I won't spend as long. Uh, and then we're going to run through last year's exam, so the 2018 exam. And uh, other than Part D, I probably won't spend a lot of time on, obviously the Part D essay questions have changed. So just in terms of the student information, I finalised the student information or the, um, that I gave you last week, but essentially it's just confirmed that the three Part D essay questions that I proposed actually are on the exam. The feedback I got was that hey, these look good, they give a range of topics and uh, no one suggested an, another article or report that they thought was suitable. So part D is essentially what you had last, what, a, what we talked about last week, those three. So I'll come back to that. Uh, so yeah, you know that it's a two-hour exam, you can take in, uh, it's closed book except that you can take in two pages of notes, anything can be on those two pages, whatever you want. I'd suggest having probably one side is the answer to part C. So, you know, writing out the, uh, the, you know, that part C essay. I just think that that makes a nice logical page. Um, you know, your answer to that, um, be because that's a great summary pretty well for the whole course. So, uh, and you know then you've effectively got probably at least eight marks in your pocket when you go in. Uh, if you've got a reasonable summary, eight to ten marks easily, you can go in knowing that you're going to get those simply by giving me a summary of what we've covered in the course with, you know, some headings and, you know, some sort of description of those treaties. Those are easy marks. So I'll come back to that. But in terms of your notes, I'd suggest a page on that and maybe a page on your, or half a page on your Part D essay, so you've got your notes of what you're going to take in. Importantly, you can't take in the Part D um, article or report, you know, which are, you know, one of them's 10 pages, one's 40 pages. You can't take that in, so you have to have read it and uh, have what you're going to say about it before you go into the exam. Uh, you can take in an unmarked bilingual dictionary as well. I would be hopeful that you would not need to use that, but obviously lots of people are working in second language, so if you feel more comfortable taking that in, take it in, uh, you're allowed. So four parts, short answer, um, medium, mandatory essay, and then the one of three essays, and just skipping over to part A, I've given you the question. <coughs> we talked about it last week. Uh, does anyone have an idea about uh, or how to explain that common misconception that so the common misconception about climate change is that a rise of mean global temperature above pre-industrial levels of two degrees will cause little or no harm because we commonly experience much greater daily temperature changes you know like it's common to see you know your minimum temperature might be 25 degrees your maximum temperature 35 so we're used to experiencing those big changes every day and we think one degree, 1.5 degrees, two degrees, that's trivial. Why, you know, why worry about that? Why is that a misconception? And does anyone have an idea about the diagram? So it says here, use a diagram if it assists your answer. So that's a big hint. So why is it that that's a misconception? Yeah, so the entire system. So, and it's commonly shown as that bell curve. And that you've, if you go back and look at the, uh, have a listen to the lecture on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and you'll see there's a section there where I talk about this, and you'll, there's a diagram with two bell curves. So you've got one bell curve, which was the old, which was the old climate regime, and when we shift 
the mean by 1.5 or 2 degrees, we shift the entire system. And so it's not the change in mean that's the big problem. It's the change in the extremes that are the other problem. Because, you know, like, say in Australia this year, we've had our hottest and driest year on record. But, you know, back in, you know, winter, for instance, you know, it might have, it was just a little bit less cold. No one really, it didn't really matter to us here in Brisbane, you know, if you got up and instead of being 15 degrees, it was 18 degrees, it was no big deal. But the problem that we see is um, from about November onwards, because it had been so hot and so dry for so long, the whole landscape was tinder dry and primed for massive bushfires. So when extreme temperatures came through in really from November onwards, the whole landscape was primed and we just saw this massive catastrophic fires uh, through large parts of Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia. So large parts of Australia have had catastrophic fires I think on last count, over 28 dead, billions of animals, billions of dollars of property damage. And so it's not the, the sh even though we've had a one degree, you know, this is driven by a one degree rise in global temperatures. Um, Australia's seen at the upper end, we're already at 1.52 degrees in terms of our average changes, because the changes around the globe are different. So we are at the, really the forefront of what other countries um, will experience. So uh, the key thing though with the bushfires is that it's the extremes that are driving them. You know, the, the really big impacts occur at the extremes. Catastrophic for Australia. So, and that diagram, cool. Okay, so that's the first question. Have a think about that uh, because I really want to emphasize it because it's to me, yeah, a really important misconception. And so if you leave this course, and in terms of climate change, you remember that and the shift, you know, that diagram with the shift, and you remember, you know, the, the base, you know, there's this international framework and its, its goal is 1.5 or 2 degrees, but that will be big, that will cause big impacts in all countries of the world. So in China, in Japan, you know, we are going to see through your careers, you will be dealing in whatever field you're working in, whatever profession, you are going to be dealing with those consequences. Even if you're not in reducing emissions, so in mitigation, you know, if you're a town planner, if you're a manager of some agricultural area, you know, you are in forestry, you know, you're in any, prof you know, any of a number of professions, you will see, we're going to see, um, Unfortunately, we're going to see things like famine. We'll see population shifts, civil unrest, civil wars in some countries, possibly wars between countries fighting over resources. So often those are going to be consequences of you know, the impacts that we see. So huge implications for the world. Um, so part A, it's just that question. Part B then, uh, there's uh, three short answer questions and uh, they might have some treaty interpretation in them. They'll definitely have a, uh, something about trade. Um, and let's go on to the exam. Um, you know, we've already got the idea from last week. Um, similar sorts of concepts will be tested this year. There won't be any surprises. Um, just to wrap up um, this, so there's the part C how about we deal with that when we look at the exam again? We've already talked about that. I've, I've said, I really suggest, uh, you know, using headings, um, have a good structure, write a paragraph or so on each uh, major treaty that we've covered. You could do, you know, your starting point might be something like, um, you know, just the list of things that are listed in the um, outline, you know? The UN Charter, International Whaling Convention, GATT, UN Human Rights Declaration, Antarctic Treaty, you know, broken within, you know, each of the four sort of periods we've talked about. I think what you'll find is, has anyone started or tried to write an essay? What you'll find is we've actually covered a lot and 32 minutes that you get for this will go really quickly. So you're going to probably only be able to write 
two or three sentences on each treaty. And I think that you'll find that that chews up 30 minutes really quickly. So have a practice uh, and you know, go in well prepared for that. But you know, as I say, you, you can go into the exam knowing that you know, you, you're going, you know what the question is going to be um, and you've got your notes there so you can go in really confident that you'll do well on it. And I really emphasise that final sentence. So I talked about how the questions are, are marked, or your answers are marked. So you get half the marks pretty well for an adequate answer that shows that you, know, you were part of the course, you listened to the lectures, what we've covered. You can describe um, you know, the course content. But then you get the top marks for being able to say something about them, show insight, critically analyze them, show greater depth. So that's where you get more marks for. And so in that essay, you can get, say, 8 out of 12 easily by just having, telling me what we've covered in lectures in a well-structured, it's easy to give you 8 or even 10 marks for a nice detailed telling me back what I've already told you. But there's a few marks at the end where I'm really looking for you to go beyond what I've told you and show some insight, show some critical analysis. And this final sentence allows you to do that. So what further developments can be expected in the future and why? So logically, about climate, it could be about dealing with population growth, it could be about any number of issues or a few. Just what do you think are the big issues that we face? How are we going to address it? Um, or will we address it well? You know, what are, will things spiral out of control? You know, what, what's going to happen? So there's a great opportunity there. Remember to deal with that in your essay. So have at least a paragraph or, you know, half a page on that. And it allows me to, to look at your essay and see that you've covered the course content well. And then say, yeah, this is, you know, you really understood this and you're showing real insight. And so, you know, 10 out of 12, 11 out of 12, 12 out of 12. You know, I'm looking to give you marks. Cool? OK, and then there's the uh, three questions uh, in part D. And so there's the science one. As we talked about last week, I tried to choose these um, around being interesting, acknowledging that people come from diverse backgrounds, um, they're recent, they address important issues, they're not too technical, and they provide good scope for critical analysis. So the first article you can choose from, have, have you guys had a look at them yet? You can click on them, they're on the, as you know, they're on the um, Blackboard site, the articles for Part D, just click on them, have a read of them. My suggestion would be go with the one that you, know, you feel is most interesting, um, because they're all meant to be not harder or you know, I really try to choose three things that are quite equal and then allow you to choose something that you're interested in. And I really want you to show me critical insight and analysis of them. So there's the science one um, about climate change in 1.5 degrees. It's got a bit of science in it. So if we just look at it for a moment, you know, it's 13 pages long with a summary on the first page, and quite a few authors in it, um, quite a few pictures, so you know, it's 13 pages, a few graphs, projected changes at 1.5 versus 2 degrees, um, again, a whole heap of projections there, and then increasing risk for human, and summaries, um, solutions. So they talk about solutions, scalability and feasibility and ethics, and a conclusion, and then a whole heap of references. So that's the science-based one. Anyone thinking of that? No? Well, can I just summarise? In when I when I for each of the um, topics, a I look at them all and choose the one that you think is most interesting or relevant to your background. And then in terms of critical analysis, so I, a key thing is you want to go just beyond describing what the authors have said 
and you need to analyze it in some way and say something about it. So uh, there's lots of things you can you know, do in terms of critical analysis. Fundamentally, it's about weighing up uh, the arguments that are put forward, you know, the value, the support for them, are they logical? So critically analyzing them. Can I give you a simple, maybe three-step approach for thinking about any one of these essays? So the first is, a, I think you can think of it in sort of three layers. Report, and within the report itself, um, look at you know, how well it's written, how it flows, are the claims well supported by the evidence? Um, so things like this, just looking at the report, what are the sorts of things we can say about this just from looking at sort of where it's published? So it's published in the journal Science and there's a whole heap of authors so, does anyone know the journal Science? So, it's one of the two leading international journals are Nature and Science. So, this is one of the top international journals. Incredibly hard to get published in it. Um, and only, you know, really good stuff generally gets published in it. So, it's really hard. Top journal. So, one of the things you could say in terms of critically analysing this, what, you know, working out how good it is, is well, you know, this is a, it's published in a, it's a group of um, highly respected authors. You can have a look at some of the authors. Um, what's their background? Ove Hugh Goldberg is a professor here at UQ in the Global Change Institute, one of UQ's and Australia's top um, climate researchers, has done a huge amount of work on coral reefs been a leading advocate for better measures to deal with climate change and the impacts on coral reefs. So yeah, he, if he's in his office, he's only like 100 metres, less than 100 metres from where we are now. So, um, so highly respected group of authors writing in a top journal. Um, and then you could read through the article and what I think you'll find is it flows logically. They look at the problem. There's some great summaries of, you know, it's well written. Um, when they make a claim, it's supported by references. So in broad terms, limiting 1.5 degrees will require annual investment in the energy sector between 1.46 and 3.51 trillion, uh, etc. And then, see, they make that claim and then they say, um, give you a reference on page 154, so you could go and have a look at reference 3. Will it take us there? It's the IPCC report and they've given a page reference. You could go and look at that and, and so in terms of critically analysing it, you might be making point, you might be um, saying, well, it's, um, this article was published in the top journal by a well-respected group of authors. Um, it's well written. The analysis flows logically. Um, the claims that they make us are, are supported by um, evidence. Um, they reference, you know, their sources. All of those things are actually critical analysis because you're not just taking what they're saying, but you're actually saying, is this a trustworthy source? Is what they're saying correct? You're looking at in many different ways uh, and basically building up a picture of, is this a good article that um, is um, credible? And so... That's looking at it internally. I think in terms of critical analysis of it, um, there's a rich area for analysis at the end. This is what particularly attracted me to the article was their solution section. Because if you look at those, and you, know, you might say, well, they talk about... Um, you know, that what the budget is, that, that's very factual, but then they start to talk about some of the solutions. Um, the majority of pathways require carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, delays, and you know, they talk about solutions. So that gives a, a rich scope for saying, well, is that realistic? You know, are they, 
you know, in that section, you can, you know, say, you know, that they, you might, for instance, conclude that they're overly optimistic, that they, uh, you know, in that section on solutions, that they're not actually dealing with reality, that, you know, this is more, I'm not saying that you'd necessarily come to, come to that conclusion, but just there's, there's scope there to talk about that section where they're really talking about the future and things that can be done, but then it's really, it's a really difficult um, section to address well. So that gives you scope to critically analyze it and say, do you agree with it? Do you think that what they've concluded is correct? Are there gaps in their analysis? And that's all within the article itself. Okay, so uh, that's critically analyzing the article, looking at you know, the claims it ma makes, how well it's written, turning them around, thinking if there's any gaps. Um, so that's within the article. So rich scope there for critical analysis. The second layer is maybe to think about things that we've covered in our course and, you know, what, um, for instance, is their analysis correct in terms of, you know, the goals that have been set for the international community for climate change, you know? They talk about 1.5 and 2 degrees, is that correct? And you can say, well, yes, that's correct. Um, but are there other things that, you know, we've covered in their course that maybe they've missed? And then a third question you can ask yourself in critically analysing it is, you know, apart from our course, are there other things that I think they've missed or that, um, you know, that I think are, you know, um, raise issues that this article that aren't addressed in it? Um, for instance, I don't think they deal with population growth, for instance. Um, you know, you might, I'm not suggesting that, you, you know, you'd necessarily deal with population growth, but they haven't addressed population growth. It isn't something we really addressed in our course, but you might take the view that until we, you know, address solutions to it, that none of this is going to work, um, or consumption. You might take the view that, you know, we need to, you know, there could be other solutions that, that you think are important that they haven't addressed then you, know, you just need to explain those and explain them logically to critically analyse it. Does that make sense? So those three layers, look within the article, does it make sense, is it well supported, does it flow well internally? Then you know, is there anything that we've covered in our course that you sh think shows a perspective on this article? And then more broadly, um, your knowledge generally, is there anything that you can you know, say about this article that you think um, you know, is a gap or does that make? So let's take that approach then for the other two articles. So that's the first one. You've got to critically analyse, discuss the implications of their arguments for future international and national action to address climate change. You know, you might, their argument is basically 1.5 is a lot better than 2 degrees. So, you know, the implications of their arguments logically are that, you know, we should be working bloody hard for 1.5, that 2 degrees has got, you know, is really risky, that 1.5 is, you know, so, you know, discuss those sorts of implications. And then provide two or more recommendations for improving, improving climate policies in any country based on the author's arguments. So, you know, let's just say you're from China. You might think about China and think, you know, what is China aiming at? Is it a actually aiming at, you know, if their argument is that we should be going for 1.5, then is what would China need to do to basically help the world be on track to achieve 1.5? You know, you might say that China needs to rapidly move to decarbonise its economy. It should be phasing out, you know, all its old coal-fired power stations, it, it, you know, that... You know, and you might think, well, that's politically unrealistic, um, or you know, there's different things that you can come at it from. I'm just looking for you to think about, you know, your country, and think about, well, if we're really serious about 1.5, what could we do, or what should we be doing? Everyone happy? So, look, I, I even if you're not choosing that article, I hope that this is exciting, and it's a fun. As I talked about, why I have this Part D essays in, it's you know, try and right, um, balance between an exam where, you know, I get to check that everyone, people that actually did the course or, you know, doing this bit of assessment actually are that, that person and 
and knowing the constraints of an ex of an exam where you, I can't expect you really to do critical analysis or much thinking because you're under the time pressure, but giving you this essay beforehand, allowing you to choose it so you can go in having thought about it, written your essay out, and then you can go into the exam with um, you know some ideas ready to write out. And as I said, you should be aiming for, say, at least 10 out of 12. So 8 to 10 out of 12 should be well, if you go in prepared, you're going to, you know, I would expect you'll get 8 to, eight to 10 easily. And then the last couple are more challenging, but, you know, if you think about it just overall, you've got 8 to 10 from the first essay, 8 to 10 from this one, you already basically passed the exam and therefore passed the course. And then everything on top of that is really just, you know, the ice. So I hope that gives you a lot of confidence. Okay, so that's the science one. And then the second one, uh, Timothy Paraqui and his colleagues wrote in Decoupling Debunked. Um, it's possible to enjoy both, is it possible to enjoy both economic growth and environmental sustainability? This question is a matter of fierce political debate between green growth and post-growth advocates, etc. Critically analyse your arguments, discuss the implications for policy and make two or more policy recommendations. So that, is anyone thinking of this one? I personally think that this will probably be the most popular um, uh, topic because no, I, I find that generally most people avoid the science one um, and uh, yeah, I think that this will be a popular one because sustainability is something that most people come with a background in and this report gives plenty of scope for critical analysis. You might really hate it, You're like you might read this and just think this is just off with the fairies complete, you know, just academic drivel that you don't like at all and you could get in and savage this report. So I didn't choose this report because I necessarily thought that it was brilliant. I chose it because it was recent, interesting and gives plenty of scope to both say good things about it but also criticise it. So, um, yeah, so there's... A bit smaller. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's this exact summary and then main findings, <coughs> contents, introduction, what is decoupling? It's basically what is decoupling that, that this is speaking about? Great. So it's if you are increasing like your economic growth, that you don't necessarily need to increase your environmental impact. That you can decouple them so that your economic growth might increase, but for instance your air quality problems decrease. So for instance in China, uh, it's working to improve its air quality. It's still working to increase its economic growth, but basically that's decoupling the two. So as economic growth increases, the air quality doesn't continue to get worse, but you decouple it, and by investing in renewables, in better mechanisms to clean, say, coal-fired power generators, um, that it improves air quality overall. So, and that's the sort of area where you know, decoupling is most commonly applied, because com people commonly look at um, smog in London, um, which was horrific after World War II when there was a lot of coal burnt in open fireplaces and there was lethal smogs in the 1960s and then they basically moved all their coal-fired generation out of the city and into large um, coal-fired power generators out of the city and they electrified the city and people moved away from burning coal in their fireplaces. And so London had you know, economic growth from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to now, but their air quality, it was horrific in the 1960s and then it's gotten much better. 
it's still problematic, but you know that's the sort of thing that China's aiming for in Beijing and the like with improving. So that's a sort of classic decoupling. And yeah, plenty there. Okay, so if we were to think about the same approach for this report, looking at it internally and then maybe things we've covered in the course and then things more broadly, what could you say about this report, do you think? In terms of, if we think about the report, the authors, um, you know, the report itself, they've put it out, it's, what, 40 pages long? Um, the, you might have never heard of the European... European Environmental Bureau. You can go and have a look at their website, see who they are. What do you think about this report in terms of, is it well presented? Cover page? Executive summary? Table of contents? Does the table of contents look logical? Yep. Pretty standard, you know, you've got the introduction, explanation, they present evidence and they reach some, com some conclusions, they've got a bibliography. So in terms of the report, you might look at it and think, well, it's a logical analysis, you know, some of their things are well, at least some of it's well supported. They've got footnotes, you know, they've got references. You could look at that and think, you know, does it flow logically? Is it well written? Is it, is what they say, is it well supported by the evidence? All of those things are critically analysing the report, you know, internally. And you come up with your own conclusions there. You might find some areas where you don't think it's well supported by the evidence, where they make logical leaps. There might be things that you think are inconsistent between the conclusions or, you know, there could be things within this report that you don't agree with. That's fine. That's exactly what I'm asking you to look at. You don't necessarily have to agree with everything and think it's all well written. If you say that, you know, the final conclusions are not well supported by the evidence, then that's great. You're showing good critical analysis. And then more broadly, you might, you know, look at things we might have covered in this course in terms of sustainable development um, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for instance. You might, like, look at... Um, I'm not sure if they... Um, you might look at this and ask, well, have they really considered the sustainable development goals, which are, you know, an important part of the green growth agenda now internationally? You know, have they ad addressed it? And also, more importantly, what solutions do they suggest? Because often, you know, I made the point a lot when you're doing your research papers that it's easy to recognise problems it's much more difficult to come up with solutions. So in terms of critically analysing this um, report or any of the reports, particularly look at that, you know, like they identify a problem, fine, but what solutions do they come up with? Like I mentioned that with the, f the first article, the science-based one, you know, they, they, they've set out this case that 1.5 would be much better than two degrees. The solution section is a rich area for critical analysis because that's the hard thing is it's easy to recognise we've got a lot of problems. It's much harder to actually come up with a solution that is politically feasible that the world is actually going to you know, adopt. Um, that's the huge challenge is coming up with solutions. So they identify a problem, have a look at their solutions. Do you think that they are realistic? You know, there's a rich area there for you to dive into and think about. Um, and then, you know, you can also think about it more broadly. But I, I would particularly with that one, think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how, how this relates to the UN Sustainable Development Goals because that's a... There's just such obvious similarities and, and um, between the ideas. These guys are talking about sustainability. Well, the international community, the Sustainable Development Goals are the big framework now for sustainability internationally. So... Um, Okay, so that's that second essay. And then the third essay oops, is the China uh, Global Energy Renewable Energy Fulcrum article. Um, and you're asked again to critically analyse the arguments made by the authors. 
discuss the implications of China's current energy policies and discuss the implications of the election of the, pre the current president of the US for future Chinese and global policies. And that was just an aspect that I wanted to bring in so that folk who are from China, you also got to also think more broadly. Um, uh, and, and also that others, you know, who mightn't be from China but want to take on this essay, that it's also something that it's not just a big home field advantage because it's only talking about your country. So I just wanted to broaden it. So, um, again, um, the article is 14 pages long. Um, the first thing um, to think about is, so these guys are talking about China, Jan Frostad and Tabitha Benny. Um, one's an associate professor at the University of Bergen, so I'm presuming that's Norway, and another is at the University of Utah in the US. So they're talking about China. Um, you could go and look at their backgrounds, but one's, what's one thing to be immediately suspicious of or to question? Yep, so it's not immediately obvious that they actually have a depth of experience in China, uh, whether they are able to speak Chinese, uh, and if they don't understand the cultural aspects of it, there could be, I'm not saying that you'll actually find that, like you might read it and it all seems fine, like they could have done a lot of research, I don't know these two authors, but you know, just in terms of critically analysing, you know, if you look at an article, like this must be really familiar for, you know, from not really understand my country. And so something that's written by foreigners doesn't necessarily reflect the uh, culture. So that's just, a, to me, it's an immediate red flag to be thinking about and not just assuming. Like if the two authors, if both of them were professors at, you know, um, uh, in, you know, from China, um, that were both based in, you know, a university in China, then, you know, that's a good indication that they're likely to be very switched on, you know, in terms of thinking, are they, I suppose it's like, you know, if you're looking at it, the article written about climate science and someone's coming in and their, their whole background is in economics, for instance, and they're writing about difficult climate science concepts that's not their background that's maybe an area that they're actually weak in so you know why this is sorry closing down so quickly I have to keep moving my mouse so sorry that it keeps flicking off but um, so I would think about that don't you I mean I wouldn't necessarily bring in the criticism that these two people are foreigners therefore they don't understand China because that's just a blatant you know, that's not really good critical thinking because that's just almost a racist sort of view, you know, you're foreigners, you don't understand us, you know, but it at least can be suspicious of it. And, um, you know, if you identify things that they clearly don't understand, that you can identify from the evidence that's presented that they're not understanding um, the Chinese government, for instance, like they refer to some policy that is now out of date or, you know, you can, if you can identify things that are wrong, you might conclude that, um, you know, there are a number of aspects of the article that are wrong. Uh, they have said X and the true situation is Y. They have said A and the true situation is B. So if you can show reasons for why they're wrong, you might conclude that, um, you know, this is a, China is a very complex, you might conclude, China is a very complex country. The authors have tried to understand it, but they really haven't. They don't really seem to have understood it. Therefore, the analysis is um, wrong uh, and their conclusions are doubtful. You know, that is really good critical analysis without saying they're foreigners, we should just ignore them. Um, uh, does that make sense? 
so yeah like I, I mean I'm I would never write an article about China because I don't I can't read Mandarin so there is and I know um, there are so many difficult areas in terms of culture uh, and plus I just think also that there's no recommendations that foreigners can often give that will be accepted basically it's really difficult for um, foreigners to make recommendations that will be adopted in a country whether it's you know, a Chinese person writing about Australia and saying Australia should adopt better, you know, bushfire management because it's clearly failing what it's doing. You know, if that comes from, you know, the fire chief in Australia who's been on the ground and has been 20 years in Australia and, you know, can speak the lingo and has got a lot of credibility, that sounds credible. But if it's, you know, like a professor in economics at the University of Beijing, um, then there's no real credibility. Um, particularly if they've got a foreign accent and everyone just thinks, oh, the foreigner, what do they understand? You know, it would be the same in Australia as in China or Japan. You know, lots of countries are very parochial. Um, so I would never try and do something like this. Credit to them, like, you know, and it's written in an Australian journal. Um, so it's, it's useful and it's a good contribution. But I'm just saying, you know, these are the sorts of things in terms of critically analysing it the sorts of things that you can think about and then look for the evidence and then support that in your essay. So, um, yeah, so for people who are from China, then there might be things there that you think are wrong. By all means, um, say that. Um, but mostly they've, what I, you know, from my reading it, reading of it, they've, you know, it seems well researched. There's a lot of um, citation of different sources. Uh, it seems to be correct with what my with m my understanding, which is admittedly very superficial. China is a very complex country, but it seems to be um, accurate, accurate, uh, and you know the article seems to be well written, and then they come through to some, you know, some useful, interesting analysis. So I thought it was an interesting article, which is the reason why I put it forward on... on I'm not saying that I think it's all wrong, because they're foreigners. I um, think it's really interesting, but I'm also conscious of my own. You know, part of your critical thinking is actually thinking about your own biases and the things that you don't know. So me, in reading this article, I'm conscious of that myself, and would want to dig into it more. If I needed to rely upon this article for something, I would want to go and research it myself, look at some of their sources, look at it in more depth um, before I relied upon it, because it's not an area that I'm really familiar with. So good critical thinking, as much think, as thinking about your own thinking, what are the biases you bring? What are the biases that the authors might bring? Um, you know, are, is it well supported by the evidence? Then, you know, do you accept that evidence? You know, the things they cite, are they from good reputable sources or are they just blog posts or, you know, quoting unnamed sources, anonymous sources, those sorts of things? If you saw that sort of stuff, that would be a real grounds for suspicion that they, you know, that it isn't well thought out, um, well analysed uh, article. And so you might be suspicious or discount the conclusions that they came to. Does it, that all sound good? Okay, so that's that second, sorry, the third article. And yeah, I hope it's, um, I thought it was really interesting. So I hope that folk who are going to do it, that you find it interesting too. Um, okay, so that's that third uh, article. And yeah, that's, Pretty well it from in terms of I know we spent a bit of time on the student information, but I hope that's useful for you for the three articles. Okay, so let's look at the uh, twenty eighteen exam. Other than we won't look at the part D essays. Okay, so this year's exam, the front page of it looks exactly like this, other than it's 2019 rather than 2018, but your front page will look identical to this. Closed book, except that you've got the um, two pages of notes and any unmarked bilingual dictionary. You can't take in any, anything electronic. 
have you know a couple of pens, your student ID card as well, and there you go. Okay, so the short answer question last year, so only one. Um, I needed the marks obviously to add up to 45, which is why there's like only one part A and different numbers. I really wanted for you guys, for the postgraduates, to really let you have the essays. Um, so in telling you both of the essays in part C and part D, that's where um, the bulk of marks are. Okay, so last year the short answer question, on the 10th of May 2018, the UN General Assembly resolved to establish a process to assess possible gaps in international environmental law and environment related instruments with a view to strengthening their implementation through a new global pact for the environment. Explain the normal process for creating and administering international treaties, such as the proposed GPE. Use a diagram if it assists your explanation, but supplement it by explaining and writing the steps involved. Okay, so I like to write exams and bring in current facts. So the GPE was a real, or is a real, pact that's been negotiated. Um, so a lot of you know questions on the this year's exam relate to current things that are going on. But you don't really need to know anything more than is in the um, question. So there's a whole heap of stuff I put in the Twitter feed about current stories. And a lot of the questions draw upon some facts of things that I've mentioned in the Twitter feed. But you don't need to go and read them and you know get across them, because I've given you enough there. And what's this question? I could have just made this question just that second paragraph. Why do you think of bring in a little bit of facts? Makes it more interesting to start with, um, but also it allows you to do something more than just you know copy out the diagram that I've given you. So the diagram is obviously um, which one? This one. So, um, so that could be a diagram that would be good to include on your two pages of notes somewhere. It can only be a small one, a small part of your page. But yeah, basically, that's a key thing to take away from this course: is when you're thinking about international negotiate or international treaties, they start, they have a start, a negotiation period, then they might enter into force, and then there's ongoing administration, typically called conferences of the parties. But as we know, there can be they can have different terms other than just COP. COP is the most common term, but like the International Whaling Convention has meetings of the International Whaling Commission each year, which is effectively the COP for it, for that treaty, and there's no COP for the Whaling Convention as such. It's the meetings of the, it's like the 60th meeting of the International Whaling Commission or whatever it is up to now each year. So it's an annual meeting, a COP, and yeah, you can set out that diagram. So last year I talked about how the mark, you get marked. Uh, so basically, you know, there's those three criteria. You get at least half the marks for showing an adequate understanding and ability to communicate and analyze a problem. So basically, if you were to set out that diagram and say nothing more, there's an easy one and a half out of three. So you can take that in. Now, to get some more marks, um, critical analysis and showing insight is always try and you know do that if you can within sticking to time limits but so explain the normal process for creating and administering um, international treaties such as the proposed GPE so um, um, you might start this by saying you know the normal process for creating and administering treaties is shown in the in the following figure and then set out that little diagram um, and then Set out some words as well about it. You know, negotiations normally formed by, you know, treaties come about when, for what reason? Why do countries enter into treaties? Why? So why does Japan and China and Australia and the US and France, like why do they come together and like have a treaty to deal with something? Why don't they each deal with it themselves? Because most of the treaties that may fall problems that cannot be solved by 
Exactly. That's a great answer. So um, the fundamental reason why countries um, you know, participate in the UN and they enter international treaties is that there's problems that they can't solve themselves. Or it's, I mean, the UN is also about relationship building and you know, reaching out and working together collaboratively, but, but treaties are really driven by problems that countries can't solve themselves. So it might be, you know, um, any number of you know, treaties we've covered, you know, international migratory species being a good example. You know, if a bird flies from China to Australia or from Japan to Australia, um, then if the countries want to protect it, then there's, you need to protect it in both countries. It's going to die out in Australia and in China and Japan as well. So collaborating and working together for problems that cross borders is the, re is the reason for why we have you know, the primary driver. So is there anything here? So if you've given that answer, you know, you've got one and a half, two marks easily. So getting that last mark, can you draw in anything about the facts and say it, you know, relate it to, to this? So 10th of May, the General Assembly resolved to establish a process to assess possible gaps in international environmental law through a new global pact for environment. So in terms of showing insight, um, well, A, the international regime is already, could you say, really complex, and there's many international treaties already. So what would be, are there any gaps that we've talked about in our course that, you know, this agreement might target? So when we looked at fisheries, was there a gap in that regime? What's the big gap in terms of international fisheries? Fishing on the, in international waters, on the high seas, there's this massive glaring gap that the in current international regime doesn't deal with very well. So that might be an area that could be targeted. And there's a, yeah. So, um, you know, you could say something in this context with these facts, just along the lines that, you know, um, you know, negotiating the global pact for environment, you know, we'll have to navigate or, you know, have to deal with the fact that there are already many treaties uh, and it's already a very complicated system, um, you know, but st still there are gaps, this, such as, you know, international or fishing on the high seas or something like that. So those are the sorts of things that you know, could still be uh, addressed in this. have to do that to get, you know, two, or two and a half marks out of three, but showing insight, showing, you know, if you can think of something like that, it's uh, a great way to just, you know, get full marks for an answer. Okay, so part B, medium length answers. Um, does anyone want to take um, a break too? We've been going for an hour. You guys happy to either, we can go on, finish a bit early, or does anyone want to take a five minute break? Had enough and just want to take a break. Go on? Okay. So, uh, three questions worth six marks each uh, in part B. I emphasised last week, stick to time limits. So, you know, for that first question, it's only worth three marks, about eight minutes. Don't, you know, get down your diagram, write a couple of paragraphs, you know, keep an eye on your time. So in your perusal time, depending on how you're going to do it, like you might decide to write out your two essays first, um, but if you do that, make sure you don't fall into the trap of spending too long. Like they've, you've got about 32 minutes to do those two essays based on their marks. So don't spend 40 minutes on each because it will mean you'll be short of time for the... And, and that, I think, is a real trap for the big essay in, or the essay in part C because it's so easy to spend, you know, you really have ne you'll have need to have practiced that essay and written it out and know how much you can write in 32 minutes because otherwise I can see, I often see it, people who have obviously written and there's a lot of detail in the start and then, you know, they keep going and 
they've missed out you know, answering questions in part B. So they might have done really well for the two essays that they haven't answered at all. So you know, there's 12 marks that they've lost entirely. Whereas if they'd actually just stuck to time, I'm, you know, by the time you've spent 32 minutes on it, I can see that you're doing really well and where you're going. And if I can see you've obviously just, you know, run out of time, um, I'm happy to, you know, be generous with, you know, I know that the time is short, but I can't give you marks if I just see a blank page. So make sure you answer every question and put down something and spend, spend the time that's actually it's worth. Um, because that's what I'm basically marking it against is, you know, what can I fairly expect for someone writing in eight minutes about this topic, given what we've covered in the course and the level that you're at. Okay, so question two. Uh, six marks, so 16 minutes. This is, was the, um, each year I set one question on trade. So this is the trade related question. The Australian government, and, and there is a trade related question on this year's exam. So the Australian government has enacted the Illegal Logging Prohibition Act to prohibit A, the importation of illegally logged timber and timber products, such as paper, into Australia, and B, the processing of illegally logged Australian saw logs. The Act does not directly pro prohibit any timber or timber related products being imported. Rather, the Act requires importers of regulated timber products and processes producers of Australian logs to conduct due diligence in order to reduce the risk that illegally logged timber is imported or processed. Uh, the Australian government is investigating whether timber that has been illegally logged in PNG is being processed in the People's Republic of China, then imported into Australia as timber products in contravention of the Act. Advise the Chinese government on whether the Act is lawful under international trade law in your answer Explain the source of the trade laws and the principles that will be applied to determine whether such restrictions are lawful. Assume that China and Australia are parties to any relevant international treaty, trade treaty. Okay, so it's about trade. So what was the treaty we looked at in relation to trade? Yep, GATT. So the general agreement on tariffs and trade. So you know that there's going to be a question on GATT. So be ready to answer it. So what's the sort of stock standard setting out the principles sort of answer? Because you need to set out the principles and then apply it and reach a conclusion. That's the key thing I'm looking for here. Applying and reaching a conclusion. But you need to start by setting out the principles. So you might start this by saying, you know, um, you know there are many international trade treaties uh, focused on you know, removing restrictions to trade. A major treaty is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, in brackets GATT, um, which was um, uh, heavily modified and up uh, under GATT. The focus is on what? It's on what's commonly called free trade, but it's about removing restrictions. And there can be many ways that countries restrict trade. It can be banning it, but it can also be imposing tariffs. It can be a whole range of things. It can also be by providing support for domestic industries so that you know, you know, if um, a, I don't know, a battery, for instance, costs $100 to produce, but your government subsidizes $90 of that, so that you can sell your batteries for $10, and then imported batteries still cost $100 to produce, but there's no subsidies for them, so that you know the domestic batteries cost $10, and the imported batteries cost $100, um, then that's a trade-related unfair advantage to your domestic production. So GATT has a whole range of different um, things that are meant to prevent those things. And there's, that's very much what the fight between China and the US is about, is all the subsidies or currency manipulation and a range of different issues. It's not just about pro prohibiting you know, goods that have come from overseas or putting greater um, value on them. It's about, for instance, you know, the US says that China subsidizes a lot of its industries and that gives an unfair advantage because Industries in the U.S. aren't give it, getting those same subsidies, and therefore, you know, like a um, 
a ton of iron that's produced um, and that's been subsidised in China and is sold at a low cost in the US, they're saying that's unfair and that there needs to be... Um, I'm not saying that that's actually necessarily the case. I'm just saying that that's the sort of fight that the US... So GATT is about removing restrictions on trade. Um, can there be restrictions on trade to protect the environment? Yes. So you might, you know, you set out a little summary of GATT and the World Trade Organization in 1994, say that there's many treaties, but, you know, GATT is a major one. Um, you could say GATT is um, primarily about, re you know, um, removing restrictions on trade and making trade um, equal, um, trade between countries equal. Um, I don't like that. Free trade is commonly used and it's a euphemism for, you know, saying how nice it is. But often, for instance, if, you know, in a country they've effectively got slave labour um, and that's effectively, you know, while I'm thinking more here like a country like um, Bangladesh where, you know, um, you know, working in sweatshops and those sorts of establishments um, and, say, in Australia, where, let's just say, producing clothes, where a company might go to Bangladesh and basically people are almost slaves. They're being paid n basically nothing to work long hours under unsafe conditions, um, you know, in poorly ventilated things where they're... Ba and, you know, lots of ways where modern slavery, people might be paid, you know, a certain amount, but then the employer deducts more than that for their way, you know, for their board or for their food, and so people basically become trapped in a cycle where they can't afford to not. They're forced to keep working, and they're not, but they're not actually able to get themselves out of poverty. So you've got to say a a, um, a factory in Bangladesh producing clothes, where effectively it's modern slavery. And then a factory in Australia. Unsurprisingly, the factory in Bangladesh can produce a shirt for, you know, one dollar, and the factory in Australia can produce the same shirt for twenty dollars. By the time you take into account, um, you know, so how we, how do you deal with those sorts of circumstances? How do you, do you just allow that to be free trade? Do you just call that free trade? Well, the shirt that's produced in Bangladesh should be able to be sold for the same amount and Australia shouldn't put barriers to say, well, the cost of this is actually $20 per shirt. We're going to put a tariff on imports from Bangladesh so that our domestic industry can be at the same level. Um, or, you know, we're going to put a tariff on them because effectively that's, you know, slavery. Um, so often f what we call free trade is... Um, has terrible consequences in many poor countries because essentially we've moved a lot of industries. That's the whole GATT system, is about essentially allowing that unre unregulated system to flourish, and there's a lot of criticisms of it. Here with um, this logging, just focusing back on that, in our answer, so we've set out GATT, we've set out that you can have restrictions to protect the environment. Um, where's that found in GATT? So it's article... 20, yeah, it's normally written with two X's in the Roman numeral style of... Uh, and what's the key thing in GATT? You can restrict trade for a range of things, but for our purposes, to protect the environment is one of the reasons you can restrict trade. But what's the key, key two key words that I'm looking for if you'd tell me? Arbitrary or... It can't be arbitrary or discriminatory. So you want to say those two words and then have a little explanation for what they mean. So you can go and have a look at some of the textbooks. There's a, I've told you about some the big cases. You could go and have a read of them. But more for context, these become really complicated, particularly arbitrary, really quickly. So I don't want you to get bogged down. Let's have a little simple summary of what does discriminatory mean? So if a trade restriction to protect the environment, it shouldn't be discriminatory. So what does that mean? It should basically treat um, everyone equally. And, and so if a good... That example of, say, a shirt, for instance, that's produced in Bangladesh, 
um, you know, any imported shirts, you're going to put a tariff on them. That's immediately discriminatory because you're treating your domestic production differently to your um, imports. So um, it can't be un unjustifiable discrimination. So treating, and the, the key flag is where you've got s more strict um, requirements for things that are being imported to domestic um, lead produced goods. I think last um, week I talked about we w the trade example was China and waste, and China had put a ban on uh, imports of um, fo what it called foreign garbage. That was clearly discriminatory in that the ban was on foreign garbage, um, but it just has to be, you can't, there has to be, it has to be unjustifiable discrimination. So something might be discriminatory, but you may hear, um, let's look at the law because we need to apply that. So we've set out discrimination is basically treating, you know, um, s something that, sh you know, um, basically treating uh, things differently based on where they come from might be a good description of discriminatory for. So particularly domestic versus overseas produced goods. So here, um, is this act discriminatory? on the facts you're given. So this is a real act uh, enacted by the Australian government. Does it only deal with imports? No. You see there in A and B, it prohibits the importation of illegally logged timber and timber products such as paper into Australia and producing of illegally logged Australian raw logs. Now, so it's dealing both with imports and with um, domestically produced logs. You might think, well, there's a bit of discrimination there in that they deal both with imported timber and products, but they don't deal with um, illegally, illegal timber products produced in Australia. But why? do they not need to worry about products? Because they've already captured the raw logs. So they don't need to worry about products because you can't magically, like if you've produced illegally, um, you know, if it's, if um, a, a log has been logged illegally, then it's still illegal, you know, you've still captured it even if it's turned into paper. Does that make sense? Um, you don't need to worry about products because you've already captured it. You've captured the illegality of the, produ of the production at the um, log stage. Whereas with, if you only dealt with raw logs being imported, you know, a country can then just turn it into paper and import the paper and they've overcome the problem. Whereas because, so even, does that make sense? Um, but basically here, you, um, I know you've only got 16 minutes, but basically just look for, does, the, does it deal with both imports and domestic predators that they're both being treated equally, then is there any discrimination? No, basically. And I want you to come to that conclusion. So if you look at it and they're dealing with both and there doesn't seem to be any discrimination, then say that. So come to a conclusion because what you're showing me is that not only were you able to write out the basic principles that we talked about and I told you would be on the exam, but under the pressure of the exam, you're showing me that you understood it enough to be given a set of facts and apply it to reach a conclusion that's right or logical. So it's showing me that you actually understand. So I want you to come to a conclusion, not just set out the principles. Does that sound okay? A and yeah, as long as you set out the principles, you're going to get at least half of the marks, so don't be stressed about it. But here, it's pretty clear there's no real discrimination. What about arbitrary? So what does arbitrary mean? Tuna, dolphin tuna sort of cases. What does arbitrary mean? So 
you'll see that it becomes, they become technical, but if we can boil it down to just a couple of key points. Um, first off, that it's proportionate to the problem, that it's you know, a reasonable response uh, to the problem that, you know, the scale of the problem and, you know, that you're not making this massively onerous um, regime for something that's actually not a problem, so it's proportionate. But also a key part of it is flexibility, so that it can, your system can adapt depending on different goods coming from many different countries, because that's the sort of problem that came up with the US shrimp tuna sort of litigation, where the US had imposed restrictions on the sale of shrimps, or what Australians call prawns, um, in the US, and they required in the, for instance, the shrimp um, turtle case it was, they required when you're capturing um, shrimps that the devices be fitted in, in um, the nets that are dragged along the bottom to basically push turtles out so that a lot of turtles weren't killed in, the, in capturing the, um, the prawns. So they had those restrictions on both domestic and imported shrimp and countries from particularly Vietnam and a number of Southeast Asian countries sued the US and won on the basis that there were different turtles. So the US had imposed these requirements for these devices but w which were designed for the turtles that were found in the Gulf of Mexico around the US and the um, Vietnam and, and others argued that they had different turtles. Situation. So basically what the US was doing was arbitrary because it wasn't flexible enough to deal with different circumstances. So yes, it's got to be basically reasonable response and um, flexible so that essentially you can justify what you're doing as, as reasonable. So here is what's Australia doing? They're not pr directly prohibiting any timber, but they require due diligence from producers and, or importers. So does that seem reasonable to you? Does it seem arbitrary or does it seem like that's a reasonable thing for Australia to do? If you're trying to deal with illegal logging and the I impacts that come from that, is it reasonable that they just require that the logs are produced legally in their country of origin and in Australia? Seems pretty fair, doesn't it? And what about flexibility? Does it allow for, you know, there's different laws in Papua New Guinea, different laws in Indonesia, different laws in China. What might be lawful in a different country? Um, if it's lawful in the country of origin, it's not saying that, you know, 50% of forests have to be left. It's not saying that at all. It's just saying that whatever is the law in the other country, the, the logs have to be produced in accordance with those laws. And importers and producers have to check that they're legally produced. Does that seem like it's arbitrary? No. Like it seems like it's a system that's flexible, it's a reasonable sort of response. So does this seem arbitrary? What's our conclusion? No. It looks, you know, that this, this regime appears to be a measure that will survive Article 20. And you can, you know, you can cover yourself by saying, you know, we'd need more detail. These arguments become really technical. But on the facts we're given, it seems okay. Like if you came to that conclusion, I'd be giving you six out of six for that. So, you, can, you know, you can get full marks on these. Um, but come to a clear conclusion that's justified according to the principles. I mean, I know that you're under pressure. I know that you've only got 16 minutes. You won't have seen these facts before. It's, it's challenging to do it in that time. Um, um, do you, does, does that seem okay to you? So basically I want you to be able to set out something about GATT talk about arbitrary and discriminatory, set out the principles. If you can do that, you can get at least three out of six for that and then apply those principles to reach a conclusion. You can easily get four or five. 
So don't be stressed about the, um, the trade question. I really just want you to have some understanding about trade and yeah, it's a really complicated, difficult area. But if you understand that, yes, we can restrict things to trade, um, but it can't be arbitrary and discriminatory, then, you know, and show me that you can say something sensible about that, you can easily get most of the marks for that question. Happy? OK, so that's the trade question. Then, question three. Uh, the Republic of Palau, a tiny Pacific nation, is struggling to manage its fisheries sustainably particularly due to illegal, unreported and unregulated unreg fishing by high-tech foreign fishing vessels uh, that enter Palau's maritime waters. Palau is a party to UNCLOS. In this context, A, explain the major maritime boundaries established under UNCLOS and what a coastal state such as Palau can regulate within its maritime zones. B, explain what is meant by the high seas and what a state can regulate in this area, either under UNCLOS or under customary international law. And C, Critically evaluate the statement that UNCLOS is good at regulating fishing within national waters, but poor at regulating fishing on the high seas. So A, what are our major maritime boundaries relevant to international environmental regulation? So the big one is the exclusive economic zone, and that's how far out. So I gave you this handout, maritime zones. You don't have to worry about the inner ones, the territorial sea and the contiguous zones. Those give additional rights for essentially boarding vessels for customs purposes and the like. So a vessel comes within your contiguous zone, you can board it and check it for drugs and those sorts of things. Um, in your, but for our purposes, the two big ones are the EEZ and the continental shelf. So within the EEZ, is goes out to 200 nautical miles from your coastline and within that what can you regulate? Fisheries, oil and gas, whatever. Basically all natural resources in that area can be regulated by you and you can also you know get money for you know the exploitation of those so you know like if a foreign fishing vessel wants to come into your waters and fish they might be able to apply for a license and they pay you for essentially for the catch. So it's a big source of revenue for a country like Palau. Then the continental shelf is what? Yep, so essentially it's the physical continental shelf adjacent to a country's coastline. And that might be, it might go out. Basically what UNCLOS required countries to do was to survey their coastlines and work out where their continental shelf dropped away. So um, you can see here in Australia, um, down around Tasmania, this um, orange mustardy sort of colour is the EZ, and it's looked quite uniform because that's just 200 nautical miles drawn around the coastline. Then this darker blue is the continental shelf. So there would have been essentially that part of the seabed was part of the continental shelf, and that's you know would have been surveyed by um, Australian vessels, and then they submitted that to the um, authority set up under UNCLOS for continental shelves to be effectively registered. And you can, Australia can regulate within the continental shelf, what can it regulate? Yeah, oil and gas exploration, but any mining as well. So any deep sea mining or, you know, that anything that's occurring on the seabed, Australia can regulate in that little section. But over here, to the east of Tasmania, there's no continental shelf. So um, in that area, I don't know where the continental shelf actually stops, but it's clearly within 200 nautical miles. So it's not shown on this map because it doesn't matter because the EZ is further out than the continental shelf goes. You know, continental shelf might be really close to a country, in which case, you know, there's nothing to add to the EZ. So for a little country like Palau, it probably has no continental shelf outside its you know, because those um, sort of uh, islands that 
rise up quickly from the seafloor, they're not going to have a continental shelf. You know, they might have been formed by a volcano or something you know, a long time ago. There's no continental shelf around them. But for a country like Australia, continental shelf is still significant and increasingly significant into the future with you know, better and better technology for getting down deep and mining. You know, a lot of these areas are very difficult to exploit because it's in the open ocean, um, it's really deep, you're subject to storms, there's a whole heap of reasons, you know, like um, that um, big um, oil disaster in the US a few years ago, the Deepwater Horizon, where that they were drilling for floating these areas are immense. But at least on paper, Australia can regulate those, you know, that particular part of the globe under, the, uh, under UNCLOS. So, yeah, continental shelf is important for oil and gas particularly. But um, just looking at this diagram, Within the EEZ, you can regulate everything happening on the seafloor or in the water body, water body above it. So if you're fishing, you know, if a, if a person is there with a fishing line in or a big net and they're going through and they're catching fish, you know, above the seafloor, then that can be regulated by the coastal state. But out here on the continental shelf past 200 nautical miles, you can only regulate basically activities on the seafloor. So if Right here, this is say going off that area of Tasmania, and we're out past the EEZ, um, and this is say a, a vessel that's um, from Russia, is located where I've got the cursor now, then can Australia regulate fishing activity from that vessel from Russia? If it's located outside the EEZ? No, it can't. So you can only regulate on the high... So how about I move this vessel? I'll move it first here in the EZ. So there's a Russian flag vessel um, where I've got the cursor. So it's within the EZ, just off the coastline of Tasmania, the bit of the map that I was just showing. And if I looked at that geographically, it might be, say, here. So a vessel's located there. It's flagged in Russia. Can Australian fisheries vessels go on board and check its catch. Yep. Does it, and if it's going to fish there, does it require a license from Australia? Yes. So, um, but if it's here, can Australian vessels go on board? No. And so it can't be regulated unless Australia has some agreement with the country where it's flagged. So a country might agree that, you know, like if this was, if it was fishing for tuna, um, you know, southern bluefin tuna, and it was, say, a vessel from Japan, I'm not sure, I presume under the Convention on the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna that Australia and Japan have exchanged rights to inspect each other's vessels. But let's just say it's a Japanese vessel there, and it's fishing for tuna, and Australia has an agreement um, with Japan that each other can inspect, then then they could inspect but otherwise, no. Does that make sense? So yeah, so here's the, we've put the boat here now. It can't be, if it's fishing, it can't be regulated. So if I go back to here, if the, vo the boat is basically here um, and it's, it's got a net, let's just say, that's halfway down in the water column, Australia can't regulate it there. It can only regulate it if it's an Australian vessel or it's got an agreement with the country that it's from. Does that make sense? Yep. And obviously I'm using Tasmania as a nice easy example. It gets really complicated in Southeast Asia where you've got many countries and there's all these overlapping... It's nice and simple to look at here and where there's disputes between countries about territory then that's an all... that's just extra complications to this. Here's the simplest system. Sort of say around Japan, you know, to the east of Japan, then there's no real dispute about that Japan has an EEZ to the east and that it extends right out and then I'm not sure where the continental shelf ends off Japan if it's, Japan's got a big continental shelf, but um, for Palau, right out in the middle of the Pacific, it's got an EEZ, it's, you know, more than 400 nautical miles from any of its nearest neighbours, so it's got an EEZ around it and um, yet, if we just go back to the facts. 
Um, so A, explain the EZ, explain the continental shelf and basically what countries can regulate. So there's some easy marks. So yeah, and Palau, that it can, what it can regulate within its maritime waters. So it can regulate any vessel within its EZ, but outside that, you can't. Um, explain what's meant by the high seas. So that comes out anyway from, we know that it's an area outside the EZ. So even if it's on the continental shelf, it's still called the high seas. Um, because continental shelf is really about oil and gas exploration. So high seas, if you're on the high seas, um, basically you're registered, sorry, you're regulated by the country that you're registered in, unless it's, you know, you're, that country has agreed with another country. So, and that's the same under UNCLOS and under customary international law. And then critically evaluate, UNCLOS is good at regulating fishing on national waters, but poor at regulating fishing on the high seas. So is that statement basically correct? Yep, it's, it's basically correct because UNCLOS has got a lot of, gives a lot of powers to states to regulate their um, own national waters and their own maritime zones, but it's basically just doesn't deal with the high seas because it was just couldn't be agreed. And, and currently, there's a pu another push. There's been many pushes to try and better regulate fishing on the high seas. Um, but uh, there's still the main countries that oppose it are the big fishing countries now, like China, Russia, um, are particularly opposed. Or di China has now a massive. Uh, overseas fishing fleet, like it eclipses the rest of the world's overseas fishing fleets by I think an order or two of magnitude. And yeah, and it, and it's, yeah it's a real problem. Um, so in terms of critically evaluating, it's basically correct, but for a country like Palau, what's one of the big problems? You know, it might be able to regulate on paper fishing within its EZ, But the big problem for these small countries is that a lot of the high-tech vessels are really quick and they come in and they leave the EZ and the, e and the UNCLOS is still largely stuck back in the 1970s, 1980s where um, they still you know, require you to begin hot pursuit within the maritime zone so you can't just see it on your radar. You actually have to be able to be physically or audibly you know, command them to stop, start hot pursuit. With they can see, you know, there's only one um, patrol boat in that Palau has. You know, Australia donated it to it, and basically, when it leaves port, you know, they've just got observers ring up, say, you know, the patrol boat's leaving port. They can see it on the radar. They just leave. They get outside the EZ. They, you know, they're fast. They've got radar. Um, it's very difficult for Palau to actually protect its waters in practice. So, yeah, it is good on paper. In practice, it's really hard both to regulate inside and outside. But particularly on the high seas, it's just nigh on impossible because, you know, a, a company that wants to basically, um, yeah, um, do bad, you know, fish unsustainably on the high seas, you can just basically move your registration to, you know, some country that um, doesn't have any, doesn't care what you do, and you then under their regulation. So it's really hard to manage um, things on the high seas. Uh, okay, so that's question three. Core marks, relative, you know, easy to get. Tell me about the EZ, continental shelf, basically what they're about on the high seas. Okay, question four. On 26 December 2018, the government of Japan gave a formal notice of withdrawal from the whaling convention. On the same day, uh, Japan announced its intention to resume commercial whaling. Once it's not a party to the whaling convention, it will no longer be bound by the ban on commercial whaling for parties. 
and Article 11 of the Convention provides, and then you're asked to advise the government of Japan on what is the first day Japan can lawfully carry out commercial whaling, according to the normal principles for interpreting international treaties, B, upon its withdrawal from the Convention taking effect, are there any limits on where Japan can carry out commercial whaling around the globe, and C, what measures, if any, can the government of Australia and other governments opposed to commercial whaling taken to respond to Japan's withdrawal from the Convention and resumption of commercial whaling. So this question, so there's plenty of easy marks on the exam and then some that are more challenging. So um, here there's some easy marks because you know that, you know, I really want you to be aware of the normal principles for treaty interpretation. So you can start this sort of, an answer to this sort of question by setting out the normal principles for treaty interpretation and there's at least out of six, you know, one or two marks just for doing that. So you see a little extract from a treaty, give me the, those principles, what's the core principle? I gave you a handout on it. The core principle is that you interpret a treaty in good faith according to its ordinary meaning read in context. Yep. And you might refer to I don't want you to refer to a lot of um, articles of treaties, but Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is a good thing to just be able to refer to because it's a reference point. So, interpret in good faith according to its ordinary meaning. Okay, so we set that out. We're asked what is the first day. So set out the principle. So show me, like I'm sure everyone had a maths teacher when you're in you know, in school that said, don't just give me the answer, I want to see you're working out. So setting out the principle is important because it's like that maths problem, you know, I want to see you're working out, I want to see how you get to the answer so that I can see that you understand, you know, you didn't just arrive there by chance, you know, or guess. So we set out that principle, then let's go back to the facts, apply the principles to the facts and reach a conclusion. So. Article 11 of the Convention says any contracting government may withdraw from this Convention on the 30th of June of any year by giving notice on or before the 1st of January of the same year to the depository government, which will communicate to other contracting parties. The Convention shall cease to be in force on the 30th of June of the same year with respect to the government giving such notice of withdrawal. So give notice before the 1st of January and then it takes effect on the 30th of June. So here, and I mean, it, it just says that. You don't need, it's, there's no special, um, you know, we're just looking at the ordinary language. It says X, so X is what it means. Let's apply that to the facts here. Um, it gave notice on the 26th of December 2018, so that's before the 1st of January for 2019, isn't it? So when does the notification take effect? That's right, the 30th of June 2019. So, yeah, set out the principles and then just come to that conclusion. And can you see there, like, we didn't cover that Article 11 in the, um, or I might have mentioned it in the um, lecture that year because it was topical because th these were real facts. Japan had actually done that. So it brought in some real facts from the news and just given a little bit of a treaty and then that made a simple little but timely question. So we might have talked about Article 11 but I wouldn't expect you to remember that. Um, I would give you the treaty extract that I want you to interpret if I want you to do a question like this. So, pretty easy. Okay, upon its withdrawal from the convention taking effect, are there any limits on where Japan can carry out commercial whaling around the globe? So, are there any limits? Let's just say they want to come down and whale then um, south of Australia. Are there any limits to where they can whale within 
what area might they not be able to whale if it's prohibited under Australian law? The EZ. So Australia has in fact declared a whale sanctuary within its entire Australian fishing zone, which applies across the entire EZ. And the litigation that I was involved in um, a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, about Japanese whaling in waters around Antarctica was because Australia also, because it has territory in Antarctica, it's declared an EZ around Antarctica, and that's also in a whale sanctuary under the same law. So the argument in that case was that a, that, that company that was carrying out the whaling was, was breaching Australian law, and that the Australian... So there are still limits under United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, because whaling, um, I mean, whales are still marine resources, and even though there's another convention, so there can be overlap with conventions like this. So UNCLOS still applies, or can still apply. Um, so, yeah, in maritime zones of other countries that prohibit whaling. Um, but, yeah, on the high seas, it could carry out whaling, commercial whaling. Um, what measures can countries opposed to that do to respond to with its withdrawal? So it's left. So if we're thinking about measures, um, you know, the, the treaty process has failed. You know, the Japan has left, got sick of other countries not allowing commercial whaling to resume of non-endangered species. Is I think the, you know, Japan's argument has always been that we don't want to whale like blue whales, sorry, we don't want to kill whales that are critically endangered like blue whales and the like. We just want to take the ones that are already abundant. They're just marine resources like fish. We don't see them as having any special status. Therefore, all marine resources should be able to be used sustainably. That's, I think, the core of the Japanese argument. And then the, the Australia and the US have said, no, no, basically, whales, you know, even the non-endangered ones, you shouldn't whale them. So, um, so, just think of a few things, like what could do, what about, say, the product, say Japan wants to sell the whale meat, can you ban it? Yep, you could, you'd still have to comply with GATT, and, um, but with GATT, one of the things I said was if you were implementing a measure that's uh, recognised under one of the big multilateral treaties, it's much more likely to survive um, a dispute than something that you just do by yourself. So um, whale products are basically banned under CITES, all whale products. So um, you can ban it under that. Actually, is it all of them? They wouldn't all be banned under... I'm actually not sure if they're all banned under CITES, even minkies and those... Um, anyway, um, you could basically um, look at the International Whaling Convention anyway and say that commercial just have a blanket ban on whale meat. Uh, so you could have trade restrictions. What about other trade-related things? What can you do? You might... So what's happening between the US and China a lot now? the current US administration is really happy to put what on other countries? Goods produced in other countries, sanctions, economic sanctions and tariffs. So you might basically try and fine or sanction Japan economically. Um, you could also just try and shame them. So basically public denouncing, you know, diplomatic, you know, diplomatic shaming is something that countries also do. So a lot of countries, you know, have been shaming Iran over the killing of, you know, the the people um, forces, um, are shaming Iran for basically, you know, the mistake in yeah. So shaming, um, diplomatic measures, those sorts of things. Um, you know, obviously uh, there are other things that countries can do. You know, the the worst of them is going to war. But, you know, realistically, Australia isn't going to go to war um, with Japan over whaling. But those are the sorts of measures that, you know, that countries can, can do. Everything from um, low-level diplomatic shaming through economic measures, 
through um, you know banning imports through to armed conflict. Okay, so that's was question four. So that's um, pretty well it. So last year the mandatory essay question five. So we've already talked about that. Have a good structure. Go in with it well prepared. Um, make sure you spend some time talking at the end about further developments and why. And you can comfortably be looking at you know eight or ten. You know, let's just say ten out of twelve might be your goal for that that answer. That should be easily achievable by everyone. I actually saying easy is is too. I mean, I want you to to. Um, I'm giving you the question. I want you to think about it. I'm, I'm expecting high standards from it, but you know everyone here should be able to achieve um, 10 out of 12. And similarly for your critical analysis essay, everyone here should be able to achieve 8 or 10 out of 12. Um, so you know you're going in with you can go in to the exam confident that you've got a lot of marks already locked away. All you've got to do is put it down on paper. Cool. So, and we've already talked about the essays, so this was obviously last year, so I won't talk about the essays that there were last year, but there was a similar science-related one, a one about climate justice, so similar to the sustainable development one, and there's also one about um, the global pact for the environment and gaps. So there wasn't a China-related one last year, but if you look like the year before, I've often had China-related ones. So they were the three from last year. Let's not worry about them. We've talked about the essays for part D. Uh, do you guys have any questions for me? It's just on 10 to 1, so... If you've got any questions, then you can fire them away. But I'm hoping that you can go into the exam really well prepared, confident, uh, and by all means work together, like on your essays. You know, like if you've got some friends, you know, you want to form a study group, uh, and you're all choosing the same uh, Part D essay, it's fine, you know? You can work together, compare each other's ideas, um, think about your essays, what your summary is. You know, you all go in and individually produce it on the exam, but, you know, work together is fine. No more questions? Okay, well, let's wrap up at that point. Thanks for course that I recognise or recommend for international students. It's really focused on domestic people who are going to be working in Queensland. So I used to teach the course, the two courses when I was working full time at UQ. Uh, and this course that you, you guys have just, just completing was the one that was really aimed at international students who are you know, doing masters here at UQ. And then the EMVM 7123 was really aimed at domestic students who are going to be working in Queensland. and I. I used to be the program director for the environmental management masters and so a lot of international students would ask me about suggestions for um, subjects and even though I taught it I didn't, I didn't and I don't recommend ENVM 7123 unless you've got a particular interest in like you know you're a lawyer in your home country or you're working for government and you particularly want to look at how things are done in Queensland otherwise because it's really domestically focused whereas in this course I've really tried to avoid using Australia I've tried to choose examples from all around the world deliberately so that you know people could come from any country and it was all quite equal and interesting and useful for when you go home so yeah I don't recommend EMBM 7123 but I'm going to be teaching it so if I see you around uh, during the semester say hi Right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And yeah, I'll see you at the exam. So I'll be, I'll be there. <laughs>